Today's speaker is uh, Dr. Erika Walker from Teachers College uh, from Columbia University. Um, uh, Erika Walker is Clifford uh, Brister Upton Professor of Mathematical Education and Chair, Chair, Chairperson of the Department of Mathematics, Science and Technology at Teachers College, Columbia University. She's also the Director of the Institute for Urban and Minority Education at Teachers College. An award-winning former public high school mathematics teacher from, from Atlanta, Georgia. She earned her doctorate in education from Harvard University. Her research focuses on the social and cultural factors, as well as educational policies and practices that facilitate mathematics engagement, learning, and performance, especially for underdeserved students. Recognized by the National Association of Mathematicians and the Association for Women in Mathematics for her scholarship and practice, she collaborates with teachers, schools, districts, organizations, and media outlets to promote mathematics excellent and equity for young people. Her work has been published in journals such as the American Education Research Journal, Journal for Research in Mathematics Education, Educational Leadership, and the Urban Review. Professor Walker serves on several editorial boards and is the author of two books, which I highly recommend, <laughs> uh, Building Mathematics Learning Communities, uh, Improving Outcomes in Urban High Schools, and Beyond Banneker, Black Mathematicians and the Path to Excellence. So thanks, um, Erika, for agreeing to be here. We are very excited. I am very excited about it. <laughs> Uh, so I'll stop sharing and I will let you take the lead. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, um, Milena, for that wonderful introduction. It's so kind of you. And I want to thank all the other organizers on the AWN 50th Anniversary Committee, um, especially Emil and um, Lauren. Um, Darla and many others. I'm so thrilled to be invited by AWM to be part of the speaker series. I think it's so important to acknowledge the history of this great organization. And I'm so delighted to see so many of you in attendance on a summer Friday, which I know is sometimes very difficult. Um, I'm also delighted to see some folks from Teachers College, some current students, some former students, and my friends in mathematics and mathematics education from um, around the world, I believe I saw. Uh, the title of this talk is um, Storytelling for Mathematics Learning and Engagement. And um, some, I, see, I do see some familiar faces in um, the virtual audience. And so some of you have heard aspects of this talk over the years. So I was honored to be named the Etta Faulkner lecture, Lecturer um, several years ago by uh, the Association for Women in Mathematics and MAA. And at that talk, I sort of previewed some of these ideas. So some ideas might be familiar to some of you, and some are, are kind of new ideas I'm you know, tinkering with and I'm excited to be working on and to share with you. Um, about me, um, I always think it's important to share one's own personal narrative, particularly in a talk about storytelling. Um, so I'm a former high school mathematics teacher, as Milena mentioned. And um, mathematics has always been a rich part of my life from the time I was a, a little kid. And I talk about that in um, both my books and also in my talks. And I think it's important to reflect on one's own personal experiences and what we bring from them in our interactions with mathematics and also in our teaching of mathematics students, whether those are elementary students, high school students, um, post-secondary students, and um, our graduate students even. Um, so one thing that has really been the focus of my work is examining the conditions of success. A lot of work in mathematics education sort of documents and redocuments over and over again uh, failure, um, often failure of students. And I take a different approach, which is to examine what we know about success, what we can learn about success, and how we can promote success and use those lessons to ensure that more people are successful in mathematics and enjoy it. Um, so I've done this research over the years with um, children in K-12 settings, as well as adults. And the work with adults is primarily going to be my focus today. But what's exciting about my research right now is that these things are blending um, together in some exciting ways. 
I will say something about the picture. I'm an art lover and um, I always liked this painting so much. And um, you can imagine my delight when I found out that the artist is actually a teacher's college alumna from 1934. And her work, Alma Thomas's work is in the Smithsonian in, in MoMA. And I just think it's wonderful. And so much of it is very mathematical. So I hope you, you enjoy that too. So why storytelling? Um, some people might find it perhaps odd or maybe just interesting that one would be talking about storytelling in relation to mathematics. And I argue that it's important for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, storytelling is kind of a natural human activity. We learn, we thrive, we work. Everything is kind of based on stories and narratives about ourselves and the things that we're doing. And I think in education in particular, some disciplines use narratives and use stories much better than other disciplines. So for example, history, social studies, the humanities, they often use stories in service to helping students become more interested in the, in the topic, helping students personalize the topic, all of these things. And so over the years, I've been thinking about what would that look like in mathematics in a real authentic way? sort of beyond a kind of um, what you might see in some textbooks now, which is you might have a little historical vignette kind of tucked to the side, or you might have an enrichment activity, you know, at the end of a lesson or something. But what would it look like to really capitalize on human beings' interest in stories for mathematics? So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some early narratives about mathematics, because I think it'll help to, um, illuminate why I think this work is so important and why I'm taking the perspective that I am. Um, the book Beyond Banneker, um, Black Mathematicians in the Past to Excellence, I wrote that book and completed that research project. Um, I shouldn't say completed because I'm still paying dividends in some future work that I'm doing um, because I felt and saw that many stories about Black excellence in mathematics were not known by the broader public, or even by some mathematicians themselves, certainly not by mathematics educators, not by math students. And so it was really uh, a case of wanting to write the historical record. Um, the Black presence in mathematics in the United States has been um, strong and sustained, um, often in spite of real obstacles. So the first the earliest mathematical narratives about black mathematicians largely center around Benjamin Banneker, which is a name that I think most people are familiar with. Um, so Benjamin Banneker's the cover of his almanac is to the left on your screen. Um, you know, we there's biographies of him. He wrote letters to Thomas Jefferson. So he's sort of well documented in the literature. What a lot of people don't know about is that there was at least, um, there was a contemporary of Banneker who lived approximately around the same time, but who died in, I think, 1790. And his name was Thomas Fuller. And I talk about Thomas Fuller and Benjamin Banneker at length in Beyond Banneker. So if you're interested to hear more about this juxtaposition, I encourage you to, to check that out. But the interesting thing about Thomas Fuller is that um, we don't know much about him other than from this obituary and a kind of uh, personal account written by two farmers who came across him. And the interesting thing about Thomas Fuller in relation to Benjamin Banneker is that Fuller was enslaved and Banneker was not. And we know so much about Benjamin Banneker, but about Thomas Fuller, we know, you know next to nothing other than he was an enslaved person and that um, he apparently was highly well regarded in his Virginia community as being a math kind of wizard. That's what the obituary says. That's what these personal accounts of him say. But his obituary also points out he was never able to read or write. And so when I think about these narratives about early black mathematicians, I think about what stories are we missing? How is it that we don't know about the Thomas Fullers of the world? What other Fullers were there? What other Fullers are there, you know, when we look at our students who are mathematically talent and for, talented and for some reason we don't know that. The two people in the center are the first um, black man um, and the first black woman in the United States to earn their doctorates in mathematics. To the left is William Clater, who I'll say a bit more 
about um, shortly. And the second is um, Euphemia Lofton Haynes, um, who was the first woman, as I mentioned. And so we have both of their papers. We know a bit more about them. And they are really um, the earliest um, mathematical PhDs in the United States. So I hope I've just given you a sort of bird's eye view that the story of Black Americans in mathematics in the United States is one of some documented history, some not documented history. We can infer some things about their lives, their challenges, their opportunities, their excellence, their mathematical work. But what do our students, what do young people know or take away from these stories? This is something that I'm hoping to explore. So in addition to these kind of historical narratives about um, Black people in mathematics, there's a kind of dominant societal narrative about mathematics that people have written about a lot, including Joe Bowler and other folks like that. What does it mean to do well in mathematics in the United States? How do people um, perceive of themselves or not as mathematics doers? And so, you know, the driving force often, um, I don't know about you, but when I tell people what I do, they often say, oh, wow, math. And I get a whole interesting narrative about their experiences about math, I get a mathematical story. And so often I find myself um, trying to bring some joy to the narrative and helping people see math as an interesting, a fun thing. Because too often the narratives I get are um, kind of sad, I will say, and they talk about their learning experiences with math and they don't seem to be very joyful experiences. Um, so there's a dominant societal narrative that is, I think, supported by popular culture in a lot of ways that paints mathematics as, you know, a super difficult subject that very few people even comprehend. You're a geek, you're a nerd, um, you're usually white, you're usually male, and that's not the real picture of mathematicians and mathematics. So um, just for one example about the impact that popular culture can have, I have several examples like this, but I'll just share this one for now, is the zeitgeist around hidden figures that happened several years ago. So Hidden Figures started out as a nonfiction book written by Margot Shutterly about Katherine Johnson and other uh, mathematicians, of, uh, women mathematicians who were Black American who worked for the precursor of NASA and then with NASA as it, as it emerged. That book was so well received and talked about, it spawned a film. So in the bottom of your screen, you can see the film's poster with Katherine Johnson standing in front of it um, and other books. So there's a young adults edition of Hidden Figures, which uh, young adult readers edition of Hidden Figures, which I highly recommend. There's also a children's book that I didn't get a chance to put on this slide. So that has spawned interest um, anecdotally in a way that we had not really seen. It was one of the first films that highlighted women mathematicians, black women mathematicians and told their stories in a real accessible, interesting way, I would say. We, we won't quibble about the historical license that was taken on some of the things, but um, you know, it was, a, it was a new moment and it had some impact on people's interest and engagement with mathematics, which I loved to see. But Black mathematicians have been telling their stories and have been sharing their work, you know, for centuries, beginning with Benjamin Banneker. And um, one of the earliest books that I ever saw um, was called Black Mathematicians and Their Works, and it was published in 1980. And what's great about this book is that um, it's out of print now, I believe, but um, it tells uh, each participating mathematician in that book shares a mathematical paper, but there are also biographical vignettes of each mathematician participating. So you get to know a little bit about their personal story juxtaposed with the mathematical content, which is something that I am using in my own work now. And lastly, around narratives around mathematics and who tells them, um, and again, another art piece that I adore from uh, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. You know, I think Jacob Lawrence is, is an interesting model. I could talk about him separately for another hour, I'm sure. 
But what I like about so much of his work is that he often took historical events like the Great Migration, like the lives of say Frederick Douglass or you know, great moments in American history and created visual narratives around these events and often commentary. And so he did research in order to paint um, these series. And I just think it's an interesting approach to history and storytelling in a visual form. So that brings me to this project that I'm doing now, which is, um, first of all, let me just be clear, I do have an agenda. I think that storytelling and narratives and broader historical narratives and broader popular culture narratives for mathematics should do good. So I definitely have an agenda and want to see mathematics. I want to help people see mathematics as something that's useful, that's interesting and enjoyable. So I've been thinking about how do we channel all of these things um, for good. And I've been working on this project, Storytelling for Mathematics Learning and Engagement. And it's really informed by research in multiple fields. So not just mathematics and mathematics education, history, psychology, sociology, et cetera. So um, I want to highlight a few of these um, theories and themes that inform this work. Um, I should have noted that this project has been fun, funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, it's a three-year research project and my co-PI working with me on it is Robin Wilson, who many of you know as a mathematician at um, Cal Poly Pomona. And it's informed by this previous work. So it's informed by not just beyond Banneker and all the research I did for that project, but it's also informed by some various storytelling um, uh, initiatives that I've done over the years. And so one of them, and I think I might have time to play just a little bit, um, is was a podcast that we developed based on interviews that we conducted with mathematicians at the joint mathematics meetings a few years ago. A few years ago was the 50th anniversary of the founding of the National Association of Mathematicians. So that's um, founded by um, Black mathematicians and allies to you know, address issues related to um, success, achievement, equity, and mathematics for Black Americans. And I thought that this was an important moment to document. And it was a way to talk to a bunch of people who happened to be at the joint math meetings about this organization. And so we had a team of graduate students from Teachers College, including some from the Media and Social Change Lab, that went with me to the joint math meetings and um, interviewed, we kind of did woman and math, man on the street interviews that were maybe five minutes where we asked people to reflect on the, the National Association of Mathematicians, NAM, but to also talk about their lives in mathematics. So I'm just going to play for you very briefly the um, trailer. I have actually loved mathematics since I was 12 years old. My mother um, finished high school and that was it. My dad, I, I don't know how far he got, but I know he did not go to high school. So they weren't really into school, but they had this, I, you know, the sense that if you do well in school, you'll do well in life. In my hometown, I belong to a group of distinguished men I'm one of the youngest, I'm 75, but one of the youngest members of the group, and they, they, they go to about 90. We're called Retired Old Men Eating Out, Romeo. <laughs> we support things within the community. I'm an oddity, I'm the only scientific person there. There should be more. If the, the recognition of science, mathematics, STEM subjects, in the general community were larger, it would be possible. Mathematics is community. The subject is itself. Something that's born out of conversation, in community, and to be able to do it requires a place. So this is what NAM is, my source of family, community, and um, place. That was doctors Don Lott, Elmira Ortega, Scott Williams, and Caleb Ashley black mathematicians and professors at different stages in their careers being interviewed as part of a research project investigating math histories of black mathematicians led by Dr. Erica Walker at Teachers College, Columbia University. So even in 
that short snippet in the entire podcast is about 25 minutes long, you're hearing something about the moments that people are choosing to share in terms of their relationship to mathematics and their experiences with mathematics. So just, just imagine that for a moment kind of on steroids where we're collecting more stories from mathematicians about specific topics, um, content topics, but also um, topics relating to their personal experiences, their journeys through mathematics, which I know is important part, an important part of this um, speaker series. So those are a couple of things that have informed my thinking about this project. But it's also informed by these key um, constructs from um, prominent educational research. And I'll just talk about them very briefly, but you can read more about these things in um, Beyond Banneker and, and some papers that I'm happy to share. So the first big construct is engagement. So the, the study is called Storytelling for Mathematics Learning and Engagement. And that engagement is doing a lot of work. First of all, engagement is always related to learning. And it encompasses um, behavioral, cognitive, and emotional aspects. So we, when we think about engagement in school, for example, a child will be less likely to learn well if they hate going to school, if there's something about school that they don't enjoy, if they're being bullied in the classroom. So all of these things, the experience affects the learning environment and in turn affects the learning of the child. And that is certainly true for mathematics. So when you think about our dominant societal narratives about mathematics um, that are prevalent in you know, popular culture, but even prevalent among some parents, some adults, some teachers, math was always my hardest subject. It's okay if you get a C in math. It's okay if you don't understand this stuff. I never understood it either. These are all very common phrases and we want to you know, have people be authentic, but we want to show them that there are other pictures of mathematics that they can share with young people for their engagement. It's super important. Um, the other uh, field that really inspires this research is um, work in literacy. Um, and I hear benefit from being at Teachers College, which is an amazing institution where we have people in education and health and psychology but also we have people working across multiple fields. And um, some of my friends in literacy, when I was finishing up the writing of Beyond Banneker, I was telling them about the work and I was characterizing all these great stories I had heard. And they directed me to some literature in the literacy field that really encapsulated what I was going after. And I'll talk a bit more about that on the next slide, but it's just something to remember that we can learn from other disciplines in order to improve our own. So one thing that I will say right now is that a lot of the research and literacy focuses on bridging out of school learning and within school learning. So what are the experiences that people have to develop their literacy skills, their reading, their writing, their interest in um, participating, um, um, in literacy um, that happened out of school that we can draw on for in-school learning. So that's an important part of this, of this study as well. And finally, um, I'm drawing from research on inquiry-based instruction in mathematics education. There's a whole field and a whole body of research that explores differences um, between, quote, traditional education where the teacher is really the center of all the activity an inquiry-based instruction where the teacher really is a, a guide, a facilitator, and that students are learning not just from um, didactic approaches, but also from contextual experiences. Um, so those are part of the constructs that are informing this work. So um, as I mentioned, I did uh, the Beyond Banneker study and very quickly realized that these stories shouldn't just be read by other mathematicians or other mathematics educators, but that when I talked to young people about the stories that mathematicians were telling me, they were very interested. So I talked to my younger nieces and nephews about the people that I was meeting and that I was interviewing for Beyond Banneker, and they were often transfixed hearing these stories of people who grew up in the 50s and 60s and maybe learned math in a one-room schoolhouse or maybe had an, a mom who had a master's in mathematics, all kinds of things 
that um, young people were picking up on. So with one of my students and now colleague who's actually working with me on the grant, Nicole Fletcher, we did a pilot study to see what kids and teachers took away from some selected mathematical stories. So we did some analyses thinking about those three constructs that I talked about earlier to see what, what, what are people possibly getting out of, these, out of these experiences. So one thing that the stories told us was that having a positive mathematics experiences were really important. So the socialization process that mathematicians talked about in a variety of ways was super important to them. Finally, the importance of um, someone crafting rich mathematical spaces for learning and engagement. So places where people did math, super important. They weren't always in school classrooms. They were in their neighborhoods. They were in their homes. They were at church. They were figuring out a problem with a neighbor. They were helping someone build something. So it wasn't the kind of traditional experiences that we typically think of, people in the community. So not necessarily highly formally educated people, um, but you know, neighbors who perhaps didn't graduate from high school or the librarian or the pastor of the church in the neighborhood, whomever. They created these rich mathematical spaces and mathematicians talked about these very movingly and in great detail. And finally, the notion that you have not just mentors in mathematics, but you have a good set of sponsors. And this is drawn directly from Brandt's work in literacy, sponsors of literacy. So it's thinking about the ways that people facilitate mathematics opportunity and learning and direct you in a way that goes beyond mentoring. And a sponsor might be someone that is in your path for, make, for a very short time or a very long time. And they might have various uh, motivations for helping direct your mathematical journey. But sponsors are very important. So something you might have noticed about these three things is that they all begin with S. And so when I talk to high school or elementary school mathematics teachers about the importance of mathematics stories and what they can tell us, these are easy for them to remember. These three things around socialization, around crafting rich spaces, and being a good sponsor. These are the things that we want teachers to do for sure, but we also want the broader public to be serving in this way for our young people. So this was as a result of the previous analyses of the stories. And when I was turning to my current project, I wanted to think about, well, how can we take those things and incorporate them in school? So it's become kind of full circle. Not all of the stories that mathematicians told were about school-based learning. They were about learning in their communities. And those were often very vivid, very rich mathematical experiences. So how could we bring those to um, classrooms. So I wanted to think about what was most important about these stories in terms of mathematics, teaching, and learning, beyond the three S's that I talked about. So the big thing is the mathematical content really should be front and center. So it, it's not an inauthentic, I'm telling you a fun story because it's a fun story. It should have a purpose, and I think it should have a mathematical purpose. So the mathematical content that mathematicians shared through these stories, it was applied, it was pure, it was you know, real world, it was school world. It was you know, a variety of mathematical stories that people, people shared. The stories told us something important about mathematics pedagogy. And this is what the pilot study with the teachers showed. Teachers talked about how um, they learned from mathematicians recounting of their school experience. So they learned from the teachers that mathematicians had. That's an interesting way to introduce that topic. I hadn't thought of that. But they also learned from the power of the story itself. I might use that as an example in my classroom. That's a great example of how to think about the Pythagorean theorem in a real world way. So teachers can get something from this too. And finally, I think what the stories have revealed that's very important is the notion of persisting in mathematics even when things aren't great. I think everyone on the call could have, an, could have a conversation or have an experience to share where they might have struggled with mathematics or weren't sure about their, their area, but something kept you pursuing mathematics. And too often for Black Americans in the United States, there have been so many obstacles that had nothing to do with mathematics, but had to do with 
racism and discrimination. So the stories are very interesting in that regard from a historical perspective, but they also provide examples of, you know, how to agitate, how to advocate, how to get things changed, and how to persist in the face of obstacles, and how to benefit when there's a moment to be capitalized on. So um, with that said, um, this is the sort of background model for our new project, which I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about now. So this, again, is the NSF project that I'm working with um, Robin Wilson and others on. And the idea is to collect more stories from mathematicians. And we are right now in the first year of this project. And we're interviewing mathematicians with a very select list of props. So 10 questions that relate to mathematics content, relate to mathematics engagement, relate to mathematics pedagogy, and relate to specific mathematical topics. So we want to hear people's stories about those things. And as you can imagine, we're getting lots of rich stories, and we're partnering with a curriculum company. And the goal is to eventually um, collect these video stories, which we're doing now, and also, um, you know, embed them in a curriculum. So we're going to have a cycle of producing short sort of video stories, three minutes at most. Um, we're going to tag them, categorize them according to content area, grade band, things like that. We're going to curate them, and they'll be embedded in um, a curriculum, um, a K through eight curriculum. So when a student gets to a unit on fractions, for example, they'll hear a mathematician telling a story about something to do with fractions, either fractions in their own work or fractions as they were taught or, or something like that that we have identified as being very engaging for students. So then what will happen is we'll have both um, a kind of digital database for these stories that can stand alone on its own. So eventually, um, Anyone in the public, these will live on a website somewhere, will be able to go and do a search and say, I want to hear a mathematician talk about um, linear equations, maybe. Or I want to hear a mathematician talk about how they surmounted a tough time in math. Or I want to hear a mathematician talk about the importance of um, you know, family support, you know, something. Um, so this digital database will stand alone, but these shorter videos will also be embedded in a curriculum. And so the model, which is the bottom sort of rectangular set, recognizes that there are these meta narratives around race, around mathematics, around teaching that really impact what happens in mathematics classrooms, K through 12 certainly, but also certainly in college. We're focusing on K through eight because we think that uh, you know, national data show us that young children are very interested in mathematics. They really are. They start off super engaged by it. That's across racial ethnic groups. That's across gender groups. And unfortunately, um, <laughs> the longer that students are in school, their love for mathematics begins to decline. So we want to try to arrest that by rethinking a curriculum that incorporates something that's human, something that's personal, something that's connected, and hopefully students will be able to see themselves in these mathematicians. So we're assuming that you know, teachers and students have their interactions before we get this um, curriculum to them. And then after the curriculum, we're hoping that teachers will broaden their knowledge, their teaching behaviors around mathematics and mathematics teaching, and that students will be more engaged, will perform better, all the usual metrics, but will also carry with them from the experience a lasting, positive, meaningful experience where they have seen mathematics in a new way and have connected to mathematics on an emotional and social level, which is a little different from how we think about mathematics curriculum and the work that it does. So that's kind of an overview of the project. I'm happy to answer um, more questions about it. And I just want to, um, I think end with these two points, that all of that said, all of the research, all the prior work, all the work we're doing now, this is what we really want. We want deeper appreciation and understanding of mathematics and its algorithm and processes. 
We want that for everybody, not just elementary students. We want students to be interested and engaged by mathematics and mathematics courses throughout their educational careers. Um, I know Malena and Bill Bellas, who's on the call from um, an experience I had with Bill leading um, a seminar at Park City Mathematics Institute. And the focus there was on helping professors of mathematics create more welcoming environments for mathematics to attract more students to the mathematics major. And we talked about a number of things, but one piece of it was about this engagement piece. How do you get students hooked to mathematics and keep them there? Even if they don't necessarily become a math major, will they become a math minor? Will they become a, a connoisseur of mathematics in the way that people read good novels and people want to participate in book clubs? Will they appreciate mathematics when they see it in art, when they see it in museums? Like how can we make math a welcoming place for people with a welcoming pedagogy? Thank you so much for your attention. I want to thank all of you for joining us and I'll just leave the screen on this picture because I think it is a perfect visual metaphor for what we want all people to have. Um, this is a picture that a friend of mine took and knew to send me more than 10 years ago because she saw this gentleman scribing some mathematics on the street um, in Harlem, New York, right down the street from where I live. And it's a very invitational public space for mathematics. And he's scribing subtraction action. And there are some non-trivial subtraction problems on the street for anyone, kids, adults walking by to share in. So that's what we want. We want people to share in mathematics, to welcome them to mathematics and create spaces for both of those things. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Erika, for this wonderful talk.